This is the Cover 3 Tailgate. And welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 Tailgate Interactive here on a Thursday as we will be taking questions throughout the show. From you, hanging out with us in the Cover 3 tailgate. We also have questions coming up from the big old bag of mail where you go leave us a five-star review. In that review, you put your mailbag question. We will tackle it in a mailbag episode. We appreciate everything that we've gotten. And among the different topics that we will get to today from the big old bag of mail is those things that we hold near and dear to our hearts. Uh, The things about college football that we hope sustain what is expected to be seismic changes within college football and college sports in general over the next five to 10 years or so. But as always, on a Thursday, I do like to reward those of you who showed up early. The gates open in the parking lot. You pull in, you get the spot for your RV, lawn chairs out, cracking a cold one, and Ryan's got a mailbag question. He jumped in about an hour before the show started. Said for Nelly special mailbags. It's a perfect time to address this. Who do you credit most for the previous Illini defense? The recruiter, Lovey, in Levin Smith, the coordinator, Walters, Ryan Walters, former defensive coordinator, who's now the head coach at Purdue, or the coach, Henry, who's the defensive backs coach originally, right? Yeah. Um, um so what do you think? All three. Cool. <laughs> like, um, a lot of the players that like two years ago in Illinois defense was really good. Like Devin Witherspoon was recruited by Levy. Sidney Brown was recruited by Levy. Kirby Joseph was recruited by Levy. But they didn't play well under Levy. They didn't play well until Ryan Walters, Aaron Henry, and the Brett Bielema staff showed up. Like Kirby Joseph was playing nickel corner. They moved him to free safety, and now he's a starting free safety in the NFL. So I think it's been a combination of all three. I don't really think it seems to be aging with Lovey. I think last year they had a really young secondary and it kind of paid, you know, it showed. And they're two of their best defensive linemen and Keith Randolph and Gabe Ackes were banged up all season long. Johnny Newton was hurt at the end of the year. That's why I didn't partake in the combine. I don't think they got bad. I think they just got hurt. And I think that you'll probably see they'll be back, you know, not, I don't think they're going to be a lead again this year, but I think they're going to be start being back to normal. And I think also last year having a first time coordinator calling the plays took a little bit of an adjustment period too, but I'm not worried about Illinois defense in the long term. I think they're, as long as Bielema and that staff are there, the defense is going to be fine. Yeah, that's like a, that's what he wants, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, like, that's it. That's right there from the Burt bread and butter. Um, and then in the wake of the news about Trev Alberts going to Texas A&M, we'll start with something general and then uh, dive into a little bit more of that follow-up from yesterday. Uh, Ian jumped into the tailgate and said, how much does an athletic director really matter? And do you all see that mattering more or less as the landscape moves the way we think it will? Um, They matter. Like it's the, the sports we pay the most attention to obviously are football and men's basketball and women's basketball is growing in importance because it's becoming more popular and it's creating more revenue. So therefore, it's becoming more important to the athletic director, but it's, it's like anything. It's like, if you're the head coach of a team, you know, and you take on like a CEO role where you're in charge and you're trying to make sure everybody's pulling in the right direction and everybody's doing their job. That's kind of what the AD is doing. It's like, you want to make sure that everybody has an idea of what their job is and what they're supposed to be doing, whether they're running the volleyball team or they're running the wrestling team or they're running the football team. But, Yes, financially, some sports will gar- garner far more attention. And I do think the landscape will change because the entire landscape of everything is currently changing. And we don't know exactly what the future is going to look like. There's 
a chance a lot of the sports that we currently have will go away. There's a chance we might get more of the sports. We really don't know. So, yeah, it's going to change. I have absolutely no idea how it's going to change and what it's going to look like, nor do I really know, have, nor can I really speak on being an AD, but it's important. I think that the, if you look around, some programs, some schools, I feel like kind of run themselves at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Because... I was about to say, like, not to be, uh, not to be a jerk about the question because I think the topic is fun to explore. But my answer is, it depends. Mm -hmm. It depends on what university we're talking about. It depends on what university president happens to be at that university. Mm -hmm. It depends on the booster situation and whether it's like one mega donor who you need to be able to make sure you're on the same page with, or are we trying to corral some medium donors, a large group of medium donors, the athlete being the athletic director at, Oh man, I'm so, I'm so sorry for picking on y'all, but like being the athletic director at Auburn is an immensely more difficult job mm -hmm. than it is at another program. Um, there are other schools like that. We we could even say Texas A&M being the athletic director of Texas A&M as Trev Alberts is taking on. That is an extremely difficult job. How much does an AD matter? A ton because you've got to be the one to make sure the buzzword that everyone loves is alignment. Mm -hmm. When your coach, your boosters, and your university are all on the same page, you can get things done you don't run into the kind of roadblocks when you're trying to uh, whether it's money whether it's resources whether it is like a project that you need to do you don't run into problems when everybody is on the same page that is not the case at every single school all the time so i do think an athletic director matters but how much it matters definitely depends on where you're going from place to place like where where is an athlete an easy athletic director job I lost you there for a second, Chip. What'd you say? Ooh, what is an easy athletic director job? An easy job? Yeah. Um, Where do you think it runs itself? Like, I I feel like Michigan kind of runs itself. I feel like Ohio State kind of runs itself. I feel like at this point, I, for a while, it felt like Alabama ran itself. I think Georgia's kind of approaching a spot where it runs itself. I mean, I don't think any of these jobs are easy. Like, I think if you put the wrong person in charge of any school, things could go poorly and things could, you Texas. know. Texas. I was going to say yeah. the Steve Patterson era at Texas it, was mismanaged. Mm -hmm. I think Brandon Smith said private schools. Yeah, I, I think private schools are probably a little easier, too, because you also don't have FOIA requests. But I, I just think that. That's yeah, it's it's a difficult question to answer. I don't think there really are any easy jobs. I think there are easier jobs, but I do think that like just from my own personal experience, it's I can't sit here and say that ADs don't matter because I remember for Illinois for a long time under previous leadership, like they just seemed way too okay with the status quo. Mm -hmm. And they really they were really slow and behind the times in understanding how important football was. And then Josh Whitman came in and he fixes the basketball program right away because that's what's most important to Illinois fans. And that is what has always been most important to him. But he also went after football. He took, you know, Lovey Smith was a big swing and a miss for the most part, but it was a big swing, which is something that Illinois football just really hadn't tried in a long time. He's, he's gone after winning coaches in the smaller programs, the non-revenue sports to try to boost their profile there. And just Illinois athletic department overall is in a much better spot now than it was for a very long time. So it does matter. It's just a lot of the stuff ADs do aren't really the things that we're going to be talking about on a show like this, or that most fans pay attention to. There was a, um, there was a comment that suggested that Oklahoma state used to be, cause you just did what T Boone wanted and when I talked about the one big mega donor, that's what I had in mind. You've mm -hmm. okay, here's what you do when you're the athletic director at Oklahoma State. You go to T Boone's ranch, you listen to him, you come back and you tell everyone what we're doing because it's what T Boone wants, because he's the one that's going to be able to make absolutely everything happen. So yeah, it depends. And moving forward, I would say that immensely important, if only for the fact that it, we are just going to be leading. 
like the status quo is going to, we expect be totally different. And so you, you need to have someone who's not, you can't have soft leadership as we go into like these next years and trying to figure out what's going to happen as money gets tight. Uh, Dennis Dodd actually had a story on cbssports.com where he uh, sourced a, a power conference athletic director who is already looking at the budgets. Uh, definitely go check it out. It's a little bit of a, uh, it's, it's definitely one of those pieces that you want to leave yourself some time for, but you come out of it feeling much smarter. These athletic directors are looking at budgets that are being put together under the assumption that players could be employees. Doesn't mean that they're, you know, passing on these budgets, but they are already trying to get ahead. So if you want to know why we talk with the kind of confidence, like we might be going to some sort of either collective bargaining or employment style system in college football, it's because the power conference athletic directors are preparing themselves for that financial reality. Frankly, they would be bad at their jobs if they weren't at Mm. least preparing themselves for that financial reality. And you read some of the quotes in the piece, uh, they are awfully stressed about what they're going to be ha- about what kind of decisions are going to need to be made uh, in order to make all that kind of stuff happen. So let's uh, let's re- circle back real quick to before we hit a break during the show. Uh, Tony Alford's jump from Ohio State to Michigan to be the new running back running backs coach was the the follow up, you know, to us discussing Mike Hart. Um, now that everything's been finalized, we've gotten a chance to see some, some reactions. Um, I know that we've got some comments in the tailgate before we got started on, you know, the, the rivalry aspect of this, the timing where we've got spring practice getting started here soon for Michigan and for Ohio state, you are already like a week, week and a half into spring practice. Um, thoughts on Tony Alford, uh, making that jump over to Ann Arbor. Oh, it's 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 funny like anytime you get a switch like this in a rivalry the reactions from fans are always fun to follow because ohio state fans will tell you that tony offered was a bum and he was going to get fired anyway and then michigan fans will tell you that he's just going to a better place now he can stand being at ohio state any longer uh i don't know why he made the move overall i don't know tony alford i just think that it's one of those things where he's been at ohio state for a very long time i think seven or eight seasons now Pretty much, I think, since Urban took over, and then he, he stuck around when Ryan Day became the head coach. And he's always been the running backs coach, and then they gave him like an assistant head coach title and a run game coordinator title. But a lot of the times when you see those titles, they don't really mean much as much as they help you get a little pay bump. But he's also been there for a very long time and not really seen himself get promoted from running backs coach. So it could be that he's going to Michigan because, A, you've got a new head coach there. So, we've I mean, we've talked about it a long time. Ryan Day is kind of on a hot seat where it's like if they don't come through next year and they don't beat Michigan, especially now with all the changes that Michigan has had, there might be a new staff coming to Ohio State. Meanwhile, you're going to Michigan and Sharon Moore is in his first season. So maybe you're, it's kind of a reset the clock move where I feel like I'm getting more time. And it's also a situation where maybe you go to Michigan and you feel like you've got a better chance to advance up the ladder as far as your title is concerned in the future if you do a good job there. So he's going from from one really good program to another really good program. And I think that it is kind of strange just because of the rivalry aspect of it. But again, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just need a fresh start. You are part of the old guard. A new guard is coming in. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't, I don't blame you for uh, deciding that you want to go and, and take your talents elsewhere if the opportunity was provided. And clearly, that was a, that was a big part of Sharon Moore's pitch to Tony Alford as the Wolverines pick up a, a respected running backs coach for that offensive staff. Coming up on the other side, the constant theme throughout our conversations this offseason has been about the future of college football. So what are the things that are the most important? What do we hold dear? What needs to be a part of college football's future? You and the tailgate, let us know. Tom and I, we've got three things each. We'll let you know next. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis and insights all the way to the final four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. 
Brackets are back, and you can get in the madness today on the CBS Sports app. Run men's and women's pools with friends and enter our bracket challenges for a chance to win a new Nissan Rogue and trips to the 2025 Final Four. Play today on the CBS Sports app or visit cbssports.com slash cover three. Once again, that's cbssports.com slash cover three to sign up for our bracket challenge. Play to sign up. No purchase necessary. See terms and rules for details. You know how you know it's bracket season? How? Because after watching Florida State pick up a big win in the ACC tournament over Virginia Tech yesterday, both Bud and Danny hopped on a plane to Washington, D.C. to watch the Knolls in action today. That's why they're not here. I thought you were going to say because I'm basketball taking, fever. Because I'm just out here taking it back to my old school days of the way I used to cover March Madness. <laughs> <laughs> Highlighters and red pen, baby. That's, that's how we tap into our bones. Uh, all right, this is a this is a fun one. It's been floating around in the big old bag of mail for a couple weeks, and uh, I, I thought that today would be a good one to get into it. Uh, so here we go from the actually, you know, I've got a little something that could. Be fun, right? That's right. To lockdown lane. Uh, thanks for the continued great content. Always a fantastic listen in and out of the season. Question. College football has always been about the pageantry, rivalries, arguing, and those special Saturday traditions more than just the national championship. As we move into a new era, what are three things about college football that you would protect at all costs? That if college football lost them and it would lose its you it would lose its uniqueness, which has made it survive and thrive over the course of so many changes throughout the past 100 years. Well, we've already lost one for the most part, which is the national championship. Not no, the re the regionality aspect of the sport. Yeah. Like that's already being kind of torn up. That's one of the things that I think is important because I just I do think that as weird as it sounds, I think sports are important for this country because it allows us to argue with friends and family about something that doesn't really matter instead of getting into arguments about stuff that maybe does matter and we have no control over and kind of oh, divides like, you. Yeah, don't, I don't know I, if you've noticed more of that in our society is in yeah, recent right. years. But like, and this is something our friend Kevin Clark has written about before and has always harped on. One of the best parts of being a college football fan is rooting for your team, but also hating your rivals <laughs> and talking crap to your friends. And you kind of lose that the way things have gone, whereas it's like, listen, maybe maybe Oregon and Rutgers become rivals. Maybe they have some great games. But if you're a Rutgers fan or an Oregon fan, you're in Oregon or you're in New Jersey, you're probably not going to be running into many other Oregon or Rutgers fans to kind of just, you know, talk crap to and just kind of have fun and relate and bond over it. So that's one of the things that I hope that whatever the hell the end picture of this looks like as we go through all these changes, we do kind of go full circle and come back to whenever we have our new Super League or whatever the hell we end up with. We go more of a pro model where they have regional divisions. I hope we end up back there at least because like the Big Ten and the SEC to me are just brands now. They're not really conferences anymore. I do consider them to be gone. So I hope we end up there again someday. Yeah, the um, I I had uh, rivalries as on my list of three in general. And I like that the, you took it there because my my brain went to the old saying or it's like two things you never bring up socially religion or politics mm -hmm. it's like college football is the answer to like things that you bring up that you can fight about without it being this like huge weighty thing yeah. like religion or politics yeah like you don't end up not talking to a relative for months because you got pissed off about their opinion of florida state you know what i mean it's like and you but, honestly enjoy it you know and yeah. you're like deep down you enjoy yelling yes. at each other about the rivalry. Yes. Yes. um and but the way that i've always said it um or often said it here on the show is when i discuss rivalries you know the win your home games, beat your rivals. You want the person who works at the cubicle next to you or that you, your kids play on the same team. Like everyone who you're going to be interacting with on a somewhat regular basis in your real life, 
you would love for them to be fans of a team that you're playing so mm -hmm. that you all can have that and be able to like constantly have that driving your conversation, your interpersonal interactions. Um, that was, you, you want to just sort of trade this back and forth? Cause I've got, uh, I've got my, I've got one for you. Or do you want to do, go. Go ahead and do two and three? No, go ahead. Okay. The stadium experience. I, the, the pan, the weirdo 2020 pandemic season has given us a lot of like asterisks to coaching tenures mm -hmm. and to like program history and to even the statistics that we have from, you know, like you've been charting all the quarterback, uh, all the quarterback ratings on your, on your Tom Fernelli scale. It's like, man, that's weird. What happened in 2020 when all these quarterbacks could had incredible numbers. The, Zach the, Wilson became the number two pick. <laughs> um, the stadium experience when we came back was something that I, I really believe sets college football apart from all American sports that mm -hmm. the NFL, that the NBA and at most places, college basketball, I mean, college basketball in-person arena experience at its very best, you know, it probably can compare, but there's something about the size, even at the smaller stadiums, we're just talking about what 50,000 human beings have dedicated six hours of their day to this one thing. And they're all going to be there together and not to get weirdo or heady with it, but that shared human experience creates something that is really special. And so I, as we spin off into the future, I don't, I don't want to see the stadium experience stripped away because if we talk about what has to stick with college football for it to remain as unique as it is, I think those stadium experiences and the atmosphere that it sets are, are paramount to that. Oh, I, I'm a hundred percent with you. Cause I do think like having, been to now this makes me unique having been to multiple sports experiences in person like the atmosphere when you go to a college athletic event whether it's football or basketball or whatever is different than when you go to a pro event it's just it is like mostly it is an event it's not just a game whereas for me personally i didn't there is a big ass rabbit just staring at me through the window anyway it's very distracting <laughs> um but like for me personally I, I used to have bear season tickets like they came to Champaign and for when they were re renovating Soldier Field while I was in Champaign and like student like season tickets for students were super cheap. So me and my friends bought them and then you, you got on the bear season ticket list for when they moved back to Chicago. And so for a few years, I would go to the Bears games. But for me as a football fan, I didn't really enjoy going to games as much because I'm more interested in actually watching the football. Whereas like you're saying, being at the game is more of a communal experience. So long-term I went back to preferring to watch it on television, but it is just a completely different experience. And I do think we're kind of losing that. And I do think the pandemic kind of played a role in that too, in that like Dennis wrote that story this week about how we've seen attendance increase for two seasons in a row for the first time in a long time, which is good. Because I do think we have seen a drop partially because of the pandemic when everybody was at home and being forced to watch everything on television. A lot of people who were constantly making those trips to games and for like a lot of people like in the SEC, like most of the people in that stadium don't live in that town. Like this is a three hour drive situation every weekend there and back. It is a whole big thing. And a lot of people were looking at that watching the games at home saying, you know, this isn't half bad. It's kind of less hassle not to do it, but you're kind of, we're starting to see a rebound where more and more people are going back to games, which I think is a good thing overall, because I do think like whether you're at the game or whether you're watching it as a television product, the crowds are a big part of the sport. It's, it's like they mentioned the person who asked the question mentioned pageantry. That's what it is. Like the environment, like when you watch a premier league soccer game and the fans are singing through the entire thing, like, it's part of the appeal of watching it. It just provides more atmosphere. I um, shout out to uh, our, my guy, Joe Ovius. He said that, and a lot of people have made this point, but the closest thing in America to premier league soccer is college football. Yes. That like, that's why, that's why there's such a huge crossover of like soccer fans and college football fans. It is. You are, you are tied to where you're from. Or like, you know, where your school can be the mm -hmm. same as your neighborhood that you grew up in. Mm -hmm. Your passion is passed down through generations. You get there. There are the traditional songs. You understand like all the different moves and everything that happens there. And so that's why the stadium. I also said when I was saying makes it different from everything else in American sports. 
because that in stadium experience is close to that other, you know, like something that the globe considers some of like the highest of the sporting experience of being able to go watch, you know, a, Euro a European football match at one of these iconic stadiums. That's what you have. We've got like 15 to 25 iconic stadiums that when they are packed and when they are rocking, um, it's like, I, I, I am getting like the hairs are standing up on my neck. Just thinking about those different times and places that you've been in those, those coliseums and, and sort of just seen battle out there. It's cool. It's a, uh, it's something that I think has to stick around. Um, all right. What uh, you, you want to take the next one? For me, the third one, and this is kind of related to my first point. I also had the stadium experience as my number two. Um, just, well, actually, it was my number three. This was my number two. But <laughs> uh, just like, I would, I again, this is another thing that I feel like is gone or fraying. But just to get away, you touched on it at the start. Just getting away from the playoff being the only thing that matters. Like, I understand that from a national perspective, like our job, where we are catering to college football in general, and we're not just covering a team or a conference. The playoff is something we're going to talk about a lot because it appeals to a broader base. But I think that too much coverage of this sport is going towards the playoff and the playoff being the thing that matters more than anything and the thing that gets talked about more than anything. And we're kind of losing touch again with like the regionality where conferences and your rivalries and your relationships with people are what make this sport great and i feel like we should do anything we can to at least keep some semblance of that and i don't think you can rely on the media or the television networks to do that i think that's something you have to do as a fan if you truly care is to just try to keep that relationship because i do think it's an important part of the sport i um i would like for whatever football future we have whether it's a super league or an FBS plus I'd like it to have as many schools as possible. Um, I think there is there are two, two things stood out about this. Um, number one, I think that there will be such an incredible cynicism that would set in among the teams at the bottom of the super league that we would lose the passion of those fans. You know, like as much as Bud likes to sit here and say, take the checks, take the losses, take the checks, take the losses. I, I'm also just thinking about the general health and having a stadium filled every single seven times a season for a team that's probably going seven and five. Mm -hmm. You know, those teams in a Super League are only winning two games a year, three games a year. And the only way that I can imagine that it happens is to make this Super League or FBS Plus or whatever it is that that it's not exclusive or so restrictive that we lose fans who have been super passionate and mm -hmm. download every cover three podcast and follow their team's recruiting efforts and everything. Like they are just living and dying 12 months a year. And I think that we would lose some of those fans and the sport would be hurt. So wherever we draw the line in the sand, I don't know, but I hope it is as many schools as possible because a smaller Super League, I think, will hurt fan interest um, in a big way moving forward. Mm -hmm, for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's one thing to keep rooting for a team when they, you know, they might not be winning national titles, but you can at least expect a certain level of success every year. But when that goes away, you find out how, pe how much people are genuinely, truly interested in their team. It's um, it it is it is one of the things that I fear uh, about moving forward as we're we're sitting here and talking about all these different ways that things are gonna are gonna change. You know, maybe it is a twenty four and a twenty four and and forty eight teams like that. Forty eight teams, I guess that would be okay. But if it's only like twenty four, thirty, like if the if the super league is that small, I think I I think that college football would be hurt. So. We'll uh, we'll see what ends up happening moving forward. Feel free to uh, keep filling up the the Cover Three tailgate with all of your suggestions about the uh, the future of college football and what we need to do. Actually, we'll go ahead and ooh no not that one. Uh, Richard, has there been any any conversation about the length of the season? Do you guys think they would shorten the regular season as the playoff expands? Tom laughs because we've never been able to put toothpaste back in the tube on this one. Yeah, they'll take away television content, sure. No. The the television networks will definitely give back two or three weekends of monster ratings. I'm sure that's going to happen sometime soon. 
And isn't the NFL thinking about adding another game too? Yeah. They just added one. Listen, I, there's, there's no such thing as shortening the season. It's always going to be, can we lengthen it? I will take a, I, I will take a longer calendar if we put in another off week. Sure. I mean, think about those teams. Like every single, we're going to end up doing the uh, the 2024 win totals in July. You know, and when we do it, if the, like for those teams in every single conference, we're like, guys, I don't know. They've got eight straight games to start the season. And then their off week is the last week in October. We think they're going to get through all that without taking some potentially damaging injuries. Like I, I would love to be able to see as we are asking more and more from our college football teams, I would love to see a, an extra off week thrown into the calendar just to be able to you know, help keep teams fresher, especially the ones that are going to be going on these 16, 17 game runs deep into the college football playoff. Yeah. And you're kind of like you mentioned the injuries. You, you already see that in the NFL. Like look at the playoffs every year in the NFL, the last couple of seasons, since they've expanded their season to 17 games, it's like whose third string QB is going to lead this team to the Super Bowl to lose to Patrick Mahomes. You know what I mean? It's just, it's teams are so beaten to hell by the time they get to the end of the year. So, yep. Good point from Jackson in the tailgate. Um, this is a unique calendar year. Where we might have, uh, where we're going to have that extra off week, but I'm not sure if it's going to be part of the regular schedule moving forward, or if that's just. I mean, we, this is already a weird calendar. Well, I I know for a fact, like Illinois played a few week zero games in the recent season since Brett Bielema took over, and the reason they've done that is Bielema likes playing in week zero because it gives them an extra buy during the season. It gives them an extra week to recover. Hmm. See, Brett Bielema. Tom Fernelli, Chip Patterson, distinguished gentlemen with good ideas. That's the common thread there. Coming up on the other side, can you envision a scenario where the loser of the Big Ten or SEC title game gets left out of the 12-team playoff? That's from the big old bag of mail. And more questions from the tailgate next. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast. Uh, let's see. This one's about gameplay. Lane from the tailgate says, is the Cover 3 team in support of a one-play chance to gain 20 yards from the 25-yard line instead of an onside kick? This is uh, one of the many, you know, different ways to change kickoffs, onside kicks. You know, the idea that you get one snap, and if you get it's like a first and 20, and if you get it, then you get the ball. Do you support this instead of an onside kick? Yes. <laughs> I think an NFL kick is mostly, or an onside kick is mostly luck. Like the ball has to bounce a certain way or hoping somebody can't get their hands on it. And the odds of you recovering it are extremely low. I think the odds of you converting a fourth and 20 from the 25 are also extremely low, but at least you're playing football. You're not just kicking a ball and crossing your fingers, hoping for the best. I am a thousand percent in support of that. Have you talked, have you gotten the sense that this would be something that could be coming in terms of maybe next five years or so? I think there's a very real chance that it's coming to the NFL. I have right. no idea if it's coming to college. If it go, I, I would say if it, if it happens in the NFL and it it's fun, then it'll end up in college. I have not gotten the sense that there's the same push or support to change kickoffs in college as there have been at the NFL, even if the kick return position has been phased out of college football almost mm -hmm. entirely. And, and the NFL. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the, um, what we, didn't we play that game here on, uh, on the cover three podcast where it was guess how many kick return yards, the, uh, the like national kickoff return leaders have on the entire season. It's like 400 something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like uh, the nation's leader um, in kickoff returns was Barry and Brown from Kentucky. He only had 16 returns on the season. <laughs> yeah. 16. In a, in a 13 game showing for Kentucky kickoff returner Barry and Brown, he actually had 
only 16 returns. It's just three of them went for touchdowns. So he finished with uh, 576 yards. But think of the commercial breaks you can go to, Chip. You go to one before the kick, and then after the after the fair catch, you go to another one. It's oh, it's just it's incredible. The uh, no thanks. I don't I don't want that. Um, all right, let's go back to the big old bag of mail. This question comes from Jay Tort. Do you envision a scenario where the committee could possibly leave out the loser of the Big Ten or SEC title game? Say Team A heads to the title game at ten and two. Team B, ten and two, is sitting at home with Team C at nine and three, making the title game on a tiebreaker. Team A benefited from a Louisville type conference schedule. Could a team be punished for playing conference championship weekend to a point where they miss the CFP? Sounds a little confusing right there. So let's get out that Team A, Team B. Um, that seems. So you understand? I understand the question. They're basically okay. saying if the teams in the SEC or Big Ten championship game don't have like undefeated records or they've both got two losses and there's a bunch of three loss teams, is there a chance that the loser who ends up with three losses gets surpassed by the nine and three teams who didn't play in the game? Right. Basically yeah. the question. So yeah, and if you've if um so let's take because this is it, the way that I understand it, this is in the 12 team model. Mm -hmm. SEC and Big Ten, we assume would be among the top four conference champions. And then you would be fighting for the other seven at-large bids in the 12-team model. What are the chances that you finish in the top two of your conference standings, yet teams that are not in the top two of the conference standings end up getting ranked ahead of you by the committee at the end because of conference championships? Virtually zero. I was, I was really trying hard to make it happen. Yeah, I, I think it's... In a 12-team format, because the way they've done it now that they've gotten rid of divisions, like, yeah, there's a very realistic chance that you have two lost teams playing for a conference title in either the Big Ten or the SEC. It's just, if that's the case, like, if it's if it's 10-2 and two Georgia versus 10-2 and two LSU, odds are Georgia's still ranked third and LSU's ranked fifth. <laughs> because... Yeah. They're still it's it, they're still going to be considered the best teams in the country for the most part. So even if LSU loses to number three Georgia, it's not going to fall much further than seventh or eighth. It is still going to get one of those at large berths. And if the top two teams in your league both have two losses, that means the teams behind them have three or four or five. So I don't see teams. I think if you make a conference championship game, you're damn near guaranteed a playoff spot in the SEC or Big Ten. Yeah. yeah okay. So I. Well, you're not guaranteed crap. When I was retrofitting the five plus seven model for every year of the college football playoff that we've had so far, more or less, if you finished in the top nine of the final committee rankings, then you made the playoff mm -hmm. at, at an at-large or as one of the conference champions. I do not see a scenario where whoever finishes with the second best record in the sec or the big 10 has not in the path of getting there jumped up into the top nine of the committee's final rankings correct i absolutely see scenarios where the loser of an acc or a big 12 conference championship game could end up getting bumped and maybe a team that did not play from one of those conferences moves up i could see it happen where uh, let's just say Clemson, Florida State, and Miami are, you know, playing and they're all got pretty good records, but only two of them make the conference championship game. But Florida State had to, let's say Clemson and Miami make the conference championship game, but Florida State had to head to head to head win over Miami. Miami takes a loss, and now all of a sudden Florida State jumps ahead of Miami in the committee's rankings, picks up an at large. I do think you're dealing with those sorts of small margins. Similarly to you know Utah, Kansas State, Arizona, where there could be a situation where the team that loses falls back. There's a head-to-head -head result. The committee moves you up. I do not think that that is going to happen in the SEC or the Big Ten in the 12-team format, which, again, we are only going to have for two seasons before we expand again. <laughs> what a world. What a world. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's keep it sort of similar theme here. Uh, this one's from Minnesota Hawk. 
Love the pod question. Looking back at last year's CFP rankings. Um, it, oh, yeah. Looking back at last year's CFP rankings. It looks like there would have been two regular season rematches with Ohio State versus Penn State and Georgia versus Ole Miss. That's correct. We pointed that that out here on the Cover 3 podcast. And here we go. Do you think the committee will rank teams to try and avoid rematches in the future? Yes. Okay. I mean, the college basketball committee does it, don't they? Well, the college basketball committee has rules that don't let you line up with other conference foes within the first two rounds. Mm -hmm. There are no set rules like that with our 12 team bracket. They can't have rules like that in the college football playoff because again, over half the field will be the SEC and the big 10. So you're, you're not going to be able to avoid conference teammates playing each other. But I do think that if they have the opportunity to move a team down a seed to keep them from having a rematch in the first round, against a team that they played, whether it was in you know September, October, or maybe two weeks ago in November, they will do that. And I think that makes sense because, again, it's a television product. It's an, they, inv- yeah, it's an invitational. Mm-hmm. It is not a national championship. It is an invitational Correct. toward the playoff championship. Yeah, it's, it's a television show, and they want to make sure to keep it as fresh and interesting as possible. So they don't want Ohio State and Michigan playing two times in – in a matter of weeks or hell three times if they both end up in the big 10 title game. So it's like, yeah, if, if they have the opportunity, they will, will they be able to avoid it every single time? Of course not. Because again, the sec and the big 10 will be predominantly filling most of the spots and those teams are playing each other all season. So you're going to probably get at least one rematch a year. I was, I was thinking number one, yes, there will be rematches. Number two, I 100% believe the committee will use all of the flexibility that it is granted to adjust things so that that is the case. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's see. do you, you want to get into some, uh, you want to get into some ball talk? I guess. All right. <laughs> Jules, oh, this is a good question. Yeah. Okay. This is a, yeah, I, I, this is a ball. Hey, look, I I'm telling y'all, you we're going to have to go through some like future of college sports. We're going to have to go through some like playoff thoughts. And then you know what we do? We have a nice chaser and the chaser is ball talk. I'm, I'm sorry. All of those words are amazing together. Uh, Jules says, does the big 12 have better quarterbacks than the ACC? Um, Obviously we should, we should talk this out. So. My initial reaction is yes. Ooh. Like, I don't know. This is something I was thinking about just overall because I, I had to write, I did my quarterback power rankings last week, and it is one of those weird things where, you know, there's been so much focus on, like, in the NFL draft, how good the quarterback class is this year. Because, you know, like Drake May, Caleb Williams, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix, Bo, all these guys who were considered, you know, the top quarterbacks in the country have all left. Mm-hmm. Who's the alpha dog at quarterback? Like the last few years, you know, like last year, Caleb was the reigning Heisman winner and he came back and everybody was like, he's going to be the number one pick in the draft next year. He's superstar. The year before that, Bryce Young was the reigning Heisman winner. He came back. Like if you look at recent history, CJ Stroud, all these guys came back this year. You don't have one of those dudes. So I feel like the quarterback situation, like it'll get spun as the, it's a down year for quarterbacks. I get that. But the truth is once the season plays out, people will emerge. Top dogs will come to the, you know, the, the cream will rise to the top. And you're like, these guys are really good. Yeah. I told so, you about that. It's like, we're all, you're relative to your season. Just mm-hmm. because you don't look like the same awesome quarterback from the year before, doesn't mean you're not going to end up being one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Cause the only qualifier there is that the other quarterbacks in the country. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like if you were to ask 15 random fans who the best college quarterback is in 2024, you might get 10 different answers. And I, I so you look at these conferences, there's really not somebody that stands out. It's just when I look at the Big 12, Noah Fafita, you've mm-hmm. got Cam Rising at Utah, right? Should've so worked. these are, you got Shador, who is a very, he's, I called him in the power rankings. I said he's the hype beast's favorite quarterback, but like whether, whether you feel good or bad about him, I think the truth is somewhere in between. Like he's he's not amazing, but he's not mm-hmm. bad. He's he's perfectly good. Um, and you look at the ACC, like who's the best quarterback in the ACC? DJU, Cam, Cam Ward? Ward, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, but is Cam Ward like a superstar, or is Cam Ward kind of like a he's a he's a fun quarterback? So I think like, I'd rather I, Iron Jones than Cam Ward. Well, I, th- I think drones. So I got uh, DJU, just like off the top of my head. I said DJU, Cam Ward, drones, Kyle McCord, uh, mm-hmm. Cade Klubnick. I mean, you know, like. But that's the I thing. I feel the like. Best Cade Klubnick t- is, you know what ACC has? ACC has a lot of quarterbacks where if I show you the a certain cut up of his plays, you admit, that guy is an All-American. But if you watch all of the plays, then maybe you're not going to be quite as confident. Thomas Castellanos is out there. But Castel, I listen. Castellanos is really fun, but Castellanos is a runner. Like he's he's not threatening you with his arm very much. And then Cade Klubnik, I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't see it. I, I I've been waiting for it for a couple of years. I just I don't see it. I think Preston, I would rather hey, Preston put Stone? Haynes King on Clemson. In my opinion, that's where I'm hey, at right now. Haynes King deserves a spot in the conversation. Preston Stone from SMU. Is very interesting uh, as as he arrives as well. I got Avery Johnson as a top tier Big Twelve quarterback. Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot to be proven there. You know, a lot to prove. You mentioned uh, the Rocco the, Beck. Rocco Beck deserves a spot on the top top shelf for sure. Um, um, who's who just transferred to Houston? Who's with Willie? Uh, Donovan Smith is hurt. Yeah, but like KJ Jefferson in the Big Twelve. You've got yeah, it's. I feel like it's pretty even. I kind of side towards the Big 12. I think they've got a higher ceiling with their guys, whereas I think the guys in the ACC, maybe a higher floor? Maybe. I There's something to be said for just because your profile, especially as the quarterbacks are getting older, sticking around longer, yada, yada. Like that, if, if your mechanics and your profile do not fit being an awesome full capital Q quarterback, doesn't mean you can't win a bunch of ball games. Mm-hmm. Like that's, I think that's your like Castellanos, your DJU, maybe even your Cam Ward. It's like, uh, do you know what the ACC has? A- ACC has high floor, serviceable college quarterbacks. Yeah, a lot yeah. of Jag pluses everywhere you look. But that's the thing: which of these Jag pluses is going to emerge into an elite QB? Somebody will. Two or three guys will. We just really and, don't know who they are yet. Yeah, and nobody had Jordan Travis on the list for being as like individually excellent two years ago as what he ended up doing for Florida State. So there, there, there is room for someone to emerge because, again, just because the NFL scouts tell you that there's a huge drop-off in quarterback play does not mean that there are not going to be quarterbacks who are impactful, entertaining, and important uh, to the college football season coming up in 2024. Calandria, the whoopsie daisy king. Obviously, I, listen, I love him, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll That's see. the thing. Like, there's a huge difference between college quarterbacks that I love and good college quarterbacks. <laughs> you know, what I mean? there are yeah. a lot of guys who are mediocre as hell who I enjoy the hell out of. I think the SEC is the co- conference with the best quarterbacks. Yeah. I mean, you've got Quinn Ewers and Carson Beck, who might be the two best quarterbacks in the country, and they're both in your league. Yeah, I had those two um, plus whatever we expect we are going to get from Nico. Jackson Dart. Jackson Dart. Productive, if nothing else, whether you think he's super talented or not. What we think we could get from Wegman, what we think we could get from Nussmeyer. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I we've just listed like five or six names, and I haven't even asked you to talk yourself into Brady Cook, who's pretty like. Brady Br- Cook's perfectly adequate quarterback. Brady Cook drops into the ACC. We talk about him like being on that same top shelf as the other guys that we came out right off the jump. Yeah, like Brady Cook is a dude who's not, he's probably not going to win you a game by himself, but he's not going to cost you any games. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think, I think that's where I'm at with that. But again, the question from Jules, we appreciate it. We appreciate you hanging out. Does the big 12 have better quarterbacks in the ACC? Seems like the answer is yes, slightly, but TBD. I think the real situation is like you look at the Big Ten. The quarterback situation there, to me, going into twenty twenty four is pretty iffy. Even among your newbies, mm-hmm. like, like we were talking on yesterday's show, we have no idea when the hell is going to be Michigan starting quarterback. They're the defending national champions. Ohio State. I have made my feelings clear. 
I don't think Kyle McCord was a superstar, but I don't see how Will Howard is better than he is. And it's like these years, like Drew Aller, we had really high hopes for last year for a breakthrough, and he played well. He didn't, he wasn't terrible, but he didn't really break through. Is that going to happen this year? Like Dylan Gabriel might be the best quarterback in the Big Ten, and Dylan Gabriel is a perfectly good college quarterback. He could do everything Bo Nix did for the Ducks and just, you know, just do it lefty instead of righty. But if Dylan Gabriel is your best QB, I don't know what that says good things about the rest of your league. Do you know what indie rock band just released four EPs and is about to have their major label debut? Aiden Childs. Could. I mean, that's the thing. He, they're definitely, yeah. Aiden Childs like, could blow up and have a huge season. Michigan State quarterback Aiden Childs is the one that a lot of people are keeping a side eye on. No one's ready to throw him out there as being a top shelf Big Ten quarterback. But if he does end up rising to those kind of ranks amongst the Big Ten quarterback scene that Tom is describing right here, then I would not be surprised. All right, I think I've got an easy answer to this, so we can we can address it. Uh, Mahoney says, I haven't heard about any players struggling with school or being ineligible like I used to in the 2000s. Has NIL improved academics, or does no one care about that anymore? Um, I don't know that anybody ever really cared about it to begin with. I do think that like the two thousands was 20 years ago. So, uh, if it yeah, took it's you called, 20 years to notice, I mean, it's no, no, no. It's called, uh, when I was in school, it was blackboard. It's called mm -hmm. the development of online classes. Mm -hmm. It's called the proliferation of online classes. It's called the investment in your academic support staff that you have staff members who can provide support for these online classes that do not require in-person attendance nope and have light oversight in terms of well now chip we have to no they're not just using the internet to google the answers to the questions come on Oh, or, or I shoot the players. I was thinking about the support staff. <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> it's, it's login credentials were created for online classes, and academic support staff grew in number. It's amazing what we've been able to do to keep these players eligible. Just I will amazing. say, like, may come across as we're making fun of them for this, but I, I. I don't care because I have long well, maintained that if I want to be a lawyer, I go to law school. I go to college and I study the law. If I want to be an accountant, I go to college and I study how to become an accountant. If I want to be a football player and I'm going to college to play football, I should get credit for that. That's my class. That's what I'm trying to do with my life. The fact that that was one of the things I've long argued before we got, you know, when it was just, oh, they get scholarships, so they should get paid just make football or basketball or wrestling majors if that's what you want to do let people major in it anybody else is allowed to go to school and major wherever the hell they want let the players do the same thing i i generally um i generally do support the idea and the benefits of allowing athletes to be a part of the campus community and that there is a it's not educational in the, in the traditional sense, but I think there's a social benefit from like you leave home, you're going to college. And if the only time that you spend is only in the football facility, like not even walking across the quad or the brickyard or like whatever, whatever your own little campus community is, like just get out there and see people and socialize. Like I, I do not specifically care about what happens with, the assignments or the test scores or like some of those markers along the way. But I do, you know, as, as we think about college sports in general and, and what it can be positive for, I have spoken with a lot of um, athletes and I think we will continue to see that they enjoy their time of being just like a part mm -hmm. of it with everyone else too. So I'm, I, I hope that they always at least have the, the opportunity to be a part of campus community, even if they are professionalized as employees moving forward. Well, if you're a law school major, you can still take electives. You can still be with, you know, and that's the thing like the Connor is, well, how many of them will, if you go to be a football major, how many of them will end up in the NFL? 
my counter is I know a hell of a lot of lawyers who don't practice law with law degrees. I know a hell of a lot of people who have degrees in certain things that their current career has absolutely nothing to do with the degree that they have. I'm a history major, Chip. I host a podcast and talk football for a living. I mean, it's, yeah. So, Will, uh, to answer Mahoney's question, it is funny that, yes, before this proliferation of technology and online classes, we did have more eligibility concerns. Now, there are more ways to make sure that uh, these players are able to meet the standards that are being set at their respective universities. You can jump in on a future mailbag episode. You go and you leave us a five-star review, and in that review, you put your question. We will add it to the big old bag of mail and tackle it in a future mailbag episode. We will be back with you on Monday where, among other things, catching up with you know Danny and Bud and some of the, the latest from around college football, we'll be playing out that NCAA tournament bracket with their football programs. You know how it goes. A lot of fun exercise uh, as we continue to uh, promote and let you know about our bracket challenge. So come and join us at 11 a.m. on Monday. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Tom, thank you very much. Aaron Rodgers is a moron. <laughs>